Just for people who aren't familiar um, with uh, Mr. Navalny, just give us a sense of how important he has been in terms of the Russian political opposition to Putin over the past 10 years or so. Well, he's certainly been a thorn in Putin's side. He's been made out particularly abroad, outside Russia, as the, the leading figure of all of the Russian opposition. That's a bit misleading because, of course, there are lots of different opposition movements and it's not made up of just one person, which you'd sometimes think when looking at the media headlines about Navalny. But he has been a persistent campaigner, starting off campaigning about corruption and uh, highlighting all of the ways in which Putin and those around him were creaming off billions from the Russian state and in enriching themselves. That didn't get much traction within Russia, because after all, that is how Russia works. But then, of course, he was presented as a figurehead for all that stood in opposition to Putin. So when he was poisoned in the middle of 2020 on a, on a domestic flight in Russia with Novichok, the same poison that was used against Sergei and Yuli Skripal here in the UK, a lot of people thought that would be it. He would be out of the picture uh, from, from then on. But he chose to go back to Russia in January 2021, knowing perfectly well that the consequences could be up to and including his death. I mean, that was an extraordinary thing to do, wasn't it? Wasn't it, Kier? Why do you think it was that he did decide to make that journey back cognizant of, as you say, what almost certainly would happen to him? Well, it's extraordinary, but it's not unique. And what we should remember tonight is that there are other people in the same position as Navalny who are in just as much danger, like uh, Vladimir Karamurza, another opposition figure who has also been poisoned and has also returned to Russia. They all feel that they can't do much from outside the country. Now, you might argue they can't do a great deal from inside the country either, but it is a repeated uh, a repeated feature of being in opposition in Russia. If you're serious, you go back inside the country. Can there be much doubt? I mean, we heard what Biden said. We heard what Cameron said. Can there be any doubt at all that Putin's regime was responsible for his death? Well, there's always doubt. I mean, one of the the very rare occasions that we had the deranged foreign Russian foreign ministry spokeswoman Maria Zakharova actually saying something reasonably accurate today was that everybody outside the country has immediately leapt to conclusions. Everybody's ruled out the possibility that this is anything in any way natural. Uh, we would probably will never know, just like with Yevgeny Prigozhin, the Wagner leader in the middle of last year, there's never going to be a reliable independent inquiry into what happened. We might well see an autopsy, a post Morton from Russia saying natural causes. It was a heart attack. There'll always be that doubt. And there'll always well, be... They would say that, though, wouldn't they, of course? I mean, <laughs> They would say that, exactly. And there'll always be the recognition that were it not for how he has been treated by the Russian regime, he'd probably still be alive. I mean, the actual way that he was treated, I mean, I was reading about it today, is extraordinary. I was reading, for example, that when he was first imprisoned, I mean, it's almost like a kind of almost cliche kind of totalitarian behavior that he was made to sit in his cell day after day for 100 days and listen to a Putin speech for an hour and 41 minutes because the authorities said it would serve an educational purpose. I mean, it, it's sort of, it's Erzat's big brother type stuff. It is. But then, of course, we have to place this in context. Now, what we see today is wall-to-wall -wall media coverage of the death of one man in Russia. And somehow the fact that Russia is murdering men, women and children on an industrial scale in Ukraine every day is getting pushed out of the headlines. Mm. It's all about scale. Think about the Ukrainians that are in captivity from mm. Russia. And this has included some British citizens as well who were serving in the, in the Ukrainian That's military great. who've been subjected to systematic torture within the Russian system. This is absolutely perfectly normal and Navalny is getting all of the attention, but there's a great deal more going on besides. Yeah, it's a very, very good point and, and one we should remember. I mean, um, Keir, do you think, what impact, if any, do you think this is going to have on, on the Putin regime and what kind of legacy, again, if any, and as you say, there's been war to all media coverage today and, and obviously we in the West, many of us would like to see a change in disposition at the very least of, of the Russian government and Russian regime. So we, we, we obviously have a lot of attachment to figures like this. But in reality, A, what legacy does he leave in terms of, in, in terms of Russian politics and how will it affect, if at all, Putin's regime? Uh, well, it'll affect Putin's regime by removing an irritant, removing something mm. that was taking up quite a lot of foreign policy bandwidth. Uh, and so they'll probably be quite satisfied that he's been got rid of. There are all these dire threats that we're hearing from, from Joe Biden, from David Cameron. What are they actually going to do? Yeah, In 2021, Biden promised devastating consequences for Russia if Navalny died in prison. He also <laughs> promised devastating consequences for Russia if they invaded Ukraine, and that didn't turn out to anything. So again, matters of scale. What is it that Western 
powers are actually going to try to do to punish or influence Russia that they haven't already done over a genocidal war of colonial reconquest in Ukraine. If we just go along with the theory that he was um, removed by the Russian authorities, let's put it that way, what, what, what advantage could there be for Putin in so doing? Because obviously he'd already got him locked away in an Arctic prison cell. It doesn't seem very likely there would have been any prospect of escape or, or anything else. So why, what, why would it be in their interest for him to be killed? Well, again, time. Uh, think about the context. He's time-consuming. He's an irritant. He's somewhere that is. He's somebody that is uh, still a thorn in the Russian state's side, simply because of his status abroad. And Russia has long moved past being at all concerned about the international consequences of what it does, about its reputation. Well before the invasion of Ukraine, they were casting aside any pretense to actually be a normal state that behaved responsibly. They were moving into their historical comfort zone of being a rogue. State that carries out murders without a qualm, and this should really be seen as just a feature of that. If there's one positive consequence from this, it should be removing illusions about the possibility of any kind of sensible, rational political change within Russia. Yeah, just finally, Kier, on that, um, again, at the time of Prigozhin in particular, what, last June, um, to some extent around Navalny since and so on, that, you know, there has been a great deal of commentary, really ever since the Ukraine invasion, when that started to go south for Putin, of... Uh, his regime appearing weaker, hope perhaps in the West that he might be replaced. I mean, the regime as it currently stands, at least from the outside, appears to be rock solid, doesn't it? Absolutely. And sadly, if you've been in the business as long as I have, you've seen these predictions about the regime becoming weaker, its days being numbered, the Putin regime about to collapse. Do you think it's just wishful thinking on our, on our part? All the time. It happens all the time. It's confusing optimism and the result that uh, some people would like to see with what they actually genuinely assess is actually likely to happen. And that's a huge mistake. And, and just briefly, finally, what, why, why do you think that his regime continues to be so solid? Because, again, from the outside, you could easily make a case. I mean, as you say, to some extent, maybe it's optimism bias and, and so on. But, you know, you would think given that the war has gone where it has, admittedly, been doing a bit better for him of late, sanctions and so on, that the Progosian problem he had, that there might at least be some fractures in the edifice that is the Putin regime. And yet here we are. Well, this is something that, as you can imagine, Russia watchers, Russia analysts like me chew over endlessly. And we have these conversations. So I could talk about it for hours. But the <laughs> sure. short version is that Putin has had 20 years to prepare for this moment. Yes. They've been building themselves up and insulating themselves from the consequences of actions like this for so long that it's really quite hard to make a dent. The economy is robust because they're still selling energy, even if it's at a discount. They don't care about the losses that they're suffering in Ukraine because they never have. They're still able to throw money at recruiting new soldiers, pull the tanks out of storage from the Cold War. It's still going on. And yes, they're still solid for the time being. Keir Giles, absolutely fascinating stuff there. Senior consulting fellow of the Russian Eurasia program at the Foreign Affairs Think Tank, Think Tank Chatham House, also author of the book Russia's War and Everybody, What It Means for